Chapter Four of A Phantom Lover by Vernon Lee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What Mrs. Oak showed me in the yellow room was a large bundle of papers, some printed and some manuscript, but all of them brown with age, which she took out of an old Italian ebony inlaid cabinet. It took her some time to get them, as a complicated arrangement of double locks and false drawers had to be put in play. And while she was doing so, I looked round the room, in which I had been only three or four times before. It was certainly the most beautiful room in this beautiful house, and, as it seemed to me now, the most strange. It was long and low, with something that made you think of the cabin of a ship, with a great mullioned window that let in, as it were, a perspective of the brownish-green parkland dotted with oaks, and sloping upwards to the distant line of bluish firs against the horizon. The walls were hung with flowered damask, whose yellow, faded to brown, united with the reddish color of the carved wainscoting and the carved oaken beams. For the rest it reminded me more of an Italian room than an English one. The furniture was Tuscan, of the early seventeenth century, inlaid and carved. There were a couple of faded allegorical pictures by some Bolognese master on the walls, and in a corner, among a stack of dwarf orange trees, a little Italian harpsichord of exquisite curve and slenderness, with flowers and landscapes painted upon its cover. In a recess was a shelf of old books, mainly English and Italian poets of the Elizabethan time, and close by it, placed upon a carved wedding chest, a large and beautiful melon-shaped lute. The panes of mullioned window were open, and yet the air seemed heavy with an indescribable heady perfume, not that of any growing flower, but like that of old stuff that had lain for years among spices. "'It is a beautiful room,' I exclaimed. "'I should awfully like to paint you in it.' But I had scarcely spoken the words when I felt I had done wrong. This woman's husband could not bear the room, and it seemed to me vaguely as if he were right in detesting it. Mrs. Oak took no notice of my exclamation, but beckoned me to the table where she was standing sorting the papers. "'Look,' she said, "'these are all poems by Christopher Lovelock, and, touching the yellow papers with delicate and reverent fingers, she commenced reading some of them aloud in a slow, half-audible voice. They were songs in the style of those of Herrick, Waller, and Drayton, complaining for the most part of the cruelty of a lady called Dryope, in whose name was evidently concealed a reference to that of the mistress of Oakhurst. The songs were graceful, and not without a certain faded passion, but I was thinking not of them, but of the woman who was reading them to me. Mrs. Oak was standing with the brownish-yellow wall on a background to her white brocade dress, which, in its stiff seventeenth-century make, seemed but to bring out more clearly the slightness, the exquisite suppleness of her tall figure. She held the papers in one hand and leaned the other, as if for support, on the inlaid cabinet by her side. Her voice, which was delicate, shadowy, like her person, had a curious throbbing cadence, as if she were reading the words of a melody and restraining herself with difficulty from singing it, and as she read, her long, slender throat throbbed slightly, and a faint redness came into her thin face. She evidently knew the verses by heart, and her eyes were mostly fixed with that distant smile in them, with which harmonized a constant tremulous little smile in her lips. "'That is how I would wish to paint her,' I exclaimed within myself, and scarcely noticed what struck me on thinking over the scene that this strange being read these verses as one might fancy a woman would read love verses addressed to herself. "'Those are all written for Alice Oak, Alice, the daughter of Virgil Pomfret,' she said slowly, folding up the papers. "'I found them at the bottom of this cabinet. Can you doubt of the reality of Christopher Lovelock now?' 
the question was an illogical one for to doubt of the existence of christopher lovelock was one thing and to doubt of the mode of his death was another but somehow i did feel convinced look she said when she had replaced the poems i will show you something else among the flowers that stood on the upper story of her writing-table for i found that mrs oak had a writing-table in the yellow room stood as on an altar a small black carved frame with a silk curtain drawn over it the sort of thing behind which you would have expected to find a head of christ or of the virgin mary she drew the curtain and displayed a large-sized miniature representing a young man with auburn curls and a peaked auburn beard dressed in black but with lace about his neck and large pear-shaped pearls in his ears a wistful melancholy face Mrs. Oak took the miniature religiously off its stand, and showed me, written in faded characters upon the back, the name Christopher Lovelock, and the date, 1626. "'I found this in the secret drawer of that cabinet, together with the heap of poems,' she said, taking the miniature out of my hand. I was silent for a minute. "'Does—does does Mr. Oak know that you have got it here?' I asked and then wondered what in the world had impelled me to put such a question. Mrs. Oak smiled that smile of contemptuous indifference. I have never hidden it from any one. If my husband disliked my having it, he might have taken it away, I suppose. It belongs to him, since it was found in his house. I did not answer, but walked mechanically towards the door. There was something heady and oppressive in this beautiful room, something i thought almost repulsive in this exquisite woman she seemed to me suddenly perverse and dangerous i scarcely knew why but i neglected mrs oak that afternoon i went to mr oak's study and sat opposite to him smoking while he was engrossed in his accounts his reports and electioneering papers on the table above the heap of paper-bound volumes and pigeonholed documents was as sole ornament of his den a little photograph of his wife done some years before i don't know why but as i sat and watched him with his florid honest manly beauty working away conscientiously with that little perplexed frown of his i felt intensely sorry for this man but this feeling did not last there was no help for it oak was not as interesting as mrs oak and it required too great an effort to pump up sympathy for this normal excellent exemplary young squire in the presence of so wonderful a creature as his wife so i let myself go to the habit of allowing mrs oak daily to talk over her strange craze or rather of drawing her out about it i confess that i derived a morbid and exquisite pleasure in doing so it was so characteristic in her so appropriate to the house it completed her personality so perfectly and made it so much easier to conceive a way of painting her i made up my mind little by little while working at william oak's portrait he proved a less easy subject than i had anticipated and despite his conscientious efforts was a nervous uncomfortable sitter silent and brooding i made up my mind that i would paint mrs oak standing by the cabinet in the yellow room in the white von dyke dress copied from the portrait of her ancestress mr oak might resent it mrs oak might even resent it they might refuse to take the picture to pay for it to allow me to exhibit they might force me to run my umbrella through the picture no matter that picture should be painted if merely for the sake of having painted it for i felt it was the only thing i could do and that it would be far away my best work i told neither of my resolution but prepared sketch after sketch of mrs oak while continuing to paint her husband mrs oak was a silent person more silent even than her husband for she did not feel bound as he did to attempt to entertain a guest or to show any interest in him she seemed to spend her life a curious inactive half invalidish life broken by sudden fits of childish cheerfulness in an eternal daydream strolling about the house and grounds arranging the quantities of flowers that always filled all the rooms 
beginning to read and then throwing aside novels and books of poetry of which she always had a large number and i believe lying for hours doing nothing on a couch in that yellow drawing-room which with her sole exception no member of the oak family had ever been known to stay in alone little by little i began to suspect and to verify another eccentricity of this eccentric being and to understand why there were stringent orders never to disturb her in that yellow room it had been a habit at oakhurst as at one or two other english manor houses to keep a certain amount of clothes of each generation more particularly wedding dresses a certain carved oaken press of which mr oak once displayed the contents to me was a perfect museum of costumes male and female from the early years of the seventeenth to the end of the eighteenth century a thing to take away the breath of a bric-a-brac collector an antiquary or a genre painter mr oak was none of these and therefore took but little interest in the collection save in so far as it interested his family feeling still he seemed well acquainted with the contents of that press he was turning over the clothes for my benefit when suddenly i noticed that he frowned i know not what impelled me to say by the way have you any dresses of that mrs oak whom your wife resembled so much have you got that particular white dress she was painted in perhaps oak of oakhurst flushed very red we have it he answered hesitatingly but it isn't here at present i can't find it i suppose he blurted out with an effort that alice has got it mrs oak sometimes has the fancy of having some of these old things down i suppose she takes ideas from them a sudden light dawned in my mind the white dress in which i had seen mrs oak in the yellow room the day that she showed me lovelock's verses was not as i had thought a modern copy it was the original dress of alice oak the daughter of virgil pomfret the dress in which perhaps christopher lovelock had seen her in that very room the idea gave me a delightful picturesque shudder i said nothing but i pictured to myself mrs oak sitting in that yellow room that room which no oak of oakhurst save herself ventured to remain in alone in the dress of her ancestress confronting as it were that vague haunting something that seemed to fill the place that vague presence it seemed to me of the murdered cavalier poet mrs oak as i have said was extremely silent as a result of being extremely indifferent she really did not care in the least about anything except her own ideas and daydreams except when every now and then she was seized with a sudden desire to shock the prejudices or superstitions of her husband very soon she got into the way of never talking to me at all save about alice and nicholas oak and christopher lovelock and then when the fit seized her she would go on by the hour never asking herself whether i were or were not equally interested in the strange craze that fascinated her it so happened that i was i loved to listen to her going on discussing by the hour the merits of lovelock's poems and analyzing her feelings and those of her two ancestors it was quite wonderful to watch the exquisite exotic creature in one of these moods with the distant look in her grey eyes and the absent-looking smile in her thin cheeks talking as if she had intimately known these people of the seventeenth century discussing every minute mood of theirs detailing every scene between them and their victim talking of alice and nicholas and lovelock as she might of her most intimate friends of alice particularly and of lovelock she seemed to know every word that alice had spoken every idea that had crossed her mind it sometimes struck me as if she were telling me speaking of herself in the third person of her own feelings as if i were listening to a woman's confidences the recital of her doubts scruples and agonies about a living lover for mrs oak who seemed the most self-absorbed of creatures in all other matters and utterly incapable of understanding or sympathizing with the feelings of other persons entered completely and passionately into the feelings of this woman this alice who at some moments seemed to be not another woman but herself but how could she do it how could she kill the man she cared for i once asked her 
because she loved him more than the whole world she exclaimed and rising suddenly from her chair walked towards the window covering her face with her hands i could see from the movement of her neck that she was sobbing she did not turn round but motioned me to go away don't let us talk any more about it she said i am ill to-day and silly i closed the door gently behind me what mystery was there in this woman's life this listlessness this strange self-engrossment and stranger mania about people long dead this indifference and desire to annoy towards her husband did it all mean that alice oak had loved or still loved someone who was not the master of oakhurst and this melancholy this preoccupation the something about him that told of a broken youth did it mean that he knew it End of chapter four